and welcome from Guadalajara, Mexico to this episode of Crossing Butters with Nathan Lostick. Nathan's guest today is Juan Jose Leaño, founder and CEO of Parco, a mobile payment system for all the mobility services in Latin America. Hey Juan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be sitting on the same table as many founders that, that we respect and admire a lot. No, thanks. And thanks for coming in person. It's one of our first yeah. few in-person <laughs> podcasts. It's great. So tell me a little bit about Parco. What do you do? So Parco is a parking operating system for LATAM. Uh, we're doing 360 degree solutions everywhere around parking and mobility solutions. So we have access control solutions. We have pay by phone solutions, loyalty programs, data analytics solutions, which we've been building, obviously hearing from our clients. And, and currently we, we have a, a, a broad network of around 100 uh, projects in 28 cities in Mexico. So pre-pandemic, I would say as a user of parking in Latin America, probably 20 to 30 years behind the U.S. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about what is a parking lot operator without you guys look like? And when you put your system in, how does it work for both the operator and for a user? Yeah, definitely. So basically in Mexico, I would say uh, before us, Parking was probably the only sector where it was 100% cash. You know, maybe if you go to a store or whatever, they might accept credit cards or something else. For us, it was a 100% cash system. So that's where we saw a great opportunity. And it was a 100% cash system. We had very little technology that hadn't changed in 40 years. You had long lines uh, of, of, of people. And you, the, the invoice process was from 10 years ago, you know, literally had to go to, to the place and form to get your invoice. It, there's, there wasn't a digital solution. So that's what it looked like before us. And today, well, parking systems first, uh, all of our users have a cashless solution, a contactless solution, which is really important right now after the new normality. And they have an easier and faster way of paying their ticket. And the parking operators or the, or the parking system uh, gets a lot of inside data of how those users behave and who are those users that come into their lots. The second thing, which is also important is cash is the most expensive currency. People don't understand that, but managing so much cash as so many transactions, you have a cost of about 10%, which goes from robbery to cost of security, audit, etc. So as we display cash from, from all these parking lots, we're giving them more revenue and saving them a, a lot of cost and give them, giving them more transparency of how their transactions are done. Yeah, as a, a, a now Parco user, it's like when you use your app and are able to just walk out, hit the button and pay in the app versus going to another place and you forget that they don't have Parco and then you don't have enough cash or <laughs> happened to me recently where the restaurant where I ate was taking too long to come with the credit card. So I paid with cash yeah. and I realized I used my last cash <laughs> and then I went down and there was no way to pay with a credit card <laughs> and they have the old machines and they actually have a credit card slot yeah. that they block off. Yeah. So you can't Definitely. use. And then you have to go find an ATM, <laughs> foreign credit card. It was a whole mess. Probably took an extra 45 minutes. Yeah. So it's it's clearly a better solution than than what's out there today. Definitely. I mean, right now I know I we knew that we had uh, a great solution, a product market fit, and, and a need, a real problem that we were solving. When precisely our users call us and tell us you need to have park on this, or a friend calls me and they're like, dude, I'm in an ATM doing a 10 minute line. You know, one of our investors, you know him, Pablo. Once he called me, he was pissed off like, oh, I'm in this place. My wife is pregnant. I don't have cash. There's not an ATM here. I have to walk a mile. And I was like, Pablo, we're not there yet. <laughs> oh my God. So you, you know that you have a great solutions when, when you see these problems that you're solving and that people get really uh, hooked and, and dependent on your product. So we'll go deeper into the business in a minute or two here, but wanted to dig into kind of your background. Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur or was it something that came up in your, in your career? So, I mean, define entrepreneur, you know, I, since before I, I graduated, I, I've always had a I think a lot of leadership and an entrepreneurship uh, spirit, but I was thinking that my future was going to be more on, in terms of a social impact project. So that's where I always prepare. I was, I, I studied law. So for me, what I really was just to change the world, you know? So I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know that I was going to end up in business and more let us over in startups and technology, which was something that didn't really hit my mind when, when I was young. So 
entrepreneur, I always knew business is just something that life just comes around with, with great opportunities. So you're a lawyer and you're thinking about making the jump into starting a business. Why Parco? And tell me the backstory. Yeah. So basically I graduated from high school. I was 18 years old and I, I started working on a law firm. So here in Mexico, when, when you're a learning apprentice, you're pretty much a chauffeur, you know, you have to go everywhere, serve coffee, go send. So I would go a lot to the center of Guadalajara, uh, where, where there, there's a lot of diligences and I never have cash. You no, know? I'm, 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 I never ever before Parco, I never have cash. And so I would always park on the street because I didn't have cash to get onto, onto the parkings. So I did that for three, four times until I got a parking ticket for like $200. And I was like, wow, I didn't save any money. So, so I told uh, my, my chief of, of the law firm about this problem. I said, there has to be a solution about this. There has to be some kind of app where you can pay parking. And said, yes, I have the same problem all the time. If you do that, I'll put in the money. So for me, it wasn't something that I was looking, you know, it was just uh talk that we were having uh, while, while we were working. And, and then I said, all right, if he's giving me the money, I don't have nothing to lose, you know? So, so I literally just jump in because I had the, the problem. I, I saw it myself. So I knew there was an opportunity and I started with all of the failures that you can have when you're, when, <laughs> when you're starting a business. <laughs> so let's talk about them a little bit, because a lot of times, again, when you see Twitter or Instagram or podcasts, people hear just the highlights and it looks like you're an overnight success going yeah. from, you know, nothing to having a ton of parking all over the country and expanding to other countries. But in reality, it's a like this <laughs> is kind of a thing where you have lots of ups and downs. Walk us through some of the the downs yeah. um, and then how you were able to get past them and get to where you are today. Definitely. I think that the downs are the 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 ones that define us as a person and as a company, definitely. And last year was was a great example of that. So when I started uh, Parco, I didn't, I mean, I would say that I'm the, what a founder looked like maybe 10 years ago on these dropout people, but not what it looks like today. You know, you see all these serial founders or that executives from big firms working in. So, so for me, I never really had a real job. I have never done a business. I didn't know anything about finance. I know a little bit of a law. Uh, so so when I started, I, I didn't know anything and less about technology. So obviously it was maybe two years of pretty much failing in everything you can do when you start business in terms of the partners that you choose, how you finance your business, how do you start and, and assemble a team? So for example, we, we, we started doing the software with a third party company, which was a total failure, not doing an MVP, not asking the market what really was a problem. Obviously, our, our solution shifted many times before what we have today. So obviously, that was really painful. You know, looking back uh, with, an, with how the world is right now, with the, all of the information there's about entrepreneurship, maybe what cost us three years right now, it's something that you read in a, one book of everything you cannot do when you're starting a business. So obviously, there was a lot of downs for the first two years. After that, I think successes started to happen after after many failures uh we started one by one you know the first parking was for us it was like wow this is all we need you know and it was like oh if we have three more people that trust on us this is all that i want for the business and every time that we would hit a milestone that we thought it was just something that we never dreamed of we didn't even celebrate because we knew that if we got there we can just go to the next place so obviously uh Oh, you always have downsides and upsides, but definitely uh, the upsides give you the strength to support the downsides and the downsides give you the learning to do a better upside when, when things get better, you know? So many startups in Latin America and especially people listening, they think of Mexico as just Mexico City or Mexico City plus Monterrey, Guadalajara, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. But when you look at GDP, the state of Mexico, which includes Mexico City, is only 25% of GDP. Monterrey and Guadalajara are, I think, seven and eight. Yeah. And so you have the whole rest of the country that's got, you know, 70 or 65% of, of, of GDP. You're in 28 cities, which is not normal for, for a startup. Talk a little bit about geographic expansion inside of Mexico and why it was important for you to be in many cities around the country. Definitely. So first of all, our solution is it's a 
of, uh, obviously it's not like just a software where you just launch and you're globally. So we have to launch by cities. So it's kind of like we're rapping and Simon was saying in a podcast, like when we launch a new city, nobody really cares how many restaurants we have in the rest of cities. They just care what is our offering that we have there. So obviously for us, uh, we, we had to do it in a very strategic way. So basically what we did is map out who were the key players, like if it was a chess game that we needed to close in order to really grab a city from the most important client from there just do a, a waterfall uh, onto the rest of the clients so first we we did that obviously in guadalajara which is our town city and when we understood how we could replicate that then we started doing on the rest of the cities you know so it was just really one by one before the pandemic we had maybe eight cities and obviously the process was way more slow than how is it today we would have to be traveling to every place look at the system check it out sell in person, maybe go four or five times with the same client. So, so it was a, a slower process of, of terms of sales. And with the, when the pandemic hit, we just knew that everything we could just lower it down and digitalize it 100%. So right now I can tell you that we're in 28 cities and the whole team, including myself, might only know five cities. And the rest of the cities we have been able to launch from zero to 10, 100% remotely in and even though that our, that our companies works with with a, a hardware system, you know, so so for us that was a great milestone of understanding how to scale on an easier way. I think that's a really under-told story of the pandemic in in Latam. There's been a couple of of good articles. One from Andreessen Horowitz where they talked about how e-commerce had, I think it was seven or ten years of growth in a two-month period, and we'll link to the article in the show notes. But I think that's happened across many industries where the digital transformation or putting in digital parking or was, you know, that's probably was number 15 on the list yeah. for people. And they talk about it all the time, but they just never do it. And then the pandemic forced them yeah. to take remote meetings from somebody here instead of forcing them to fly. Same thing happened with us um, for fundraising for our own fund. I think pre pandemic, we only ever closed one or two people I think one or two LPs without, without ever meeting them in person. And I think the average number of meetings was three in person or something like that. Um, and with the pandemic, I think we've only, I've only met of the new LPs probably less than 10%. Yeah. And I think that that same thing is happening with, with other businesses. And that's w one of the big reasons why this boom in LATAM startups is, is happening right now. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the, no, not only the interaction with your customers change forever, also the internal business processes and the frictions that we saw before uh, with our clients, moreover on the business to business area, where, yeah, innovation and added value was just on top of, of the bottom list. And right now, after the pandemic, for example, in our business, uh, it was the pandemic was the worst and the best thing that could have happened, you know. And the worst thing, obviously, our revenue fell to zero. We thought it was the end of the world. But after a couple of weeks, we knew that we had a great opportunity because we had like maybe 60 days of a visual of what was going on in Europe. And most of our partners are, are Europe's. So, so we're talking to them, understanding how, how our industry was behaving. And they were like really happy because it was a huge digital boom. So we knew that there was a great opportunity and we were able to really accomplish it because our product changed from an added value to a must, you know? So by the, uh, the next day, all of the clients were just calling us and saying, we need it by tomorrow, uh, that people that didn't answer our emails. And we closed all of these sales 100% remote, where before with their huge ego, they would ask us to be there in person the next day in Mexico City at 9 a.m., you know? So that changed forever. And obviously for us, it was just scaling. As and much and as what, those, what those meetings for people who haven't been in, in LATAM business much, what those meetings were, okay, you had to fly on a day or two's notice, yeah. but then you probably had to do the meetings in the morning and then you'd go to lunch. Yeah. And many times that lunch would last four or five hours yeah. and you've used the whole day and then you have to go back and do another one. And now that just isn't acceptable, really. You have, if you want to make sales or buy products, you got to do it faster. You got to do it remote, and make it happen faster. Definitely. I mean, a lot of frictions that were in the ecosystem fell through really fast and, and obviously the results that we've seen on the last 18 months in the ecosystem are, are an effect of on, on those frictions that that came on the customer side on the business to business side on the investment side so so yeah the pandemic in that terms was great 
And you mentioned that your your business deals with hardware, but you yourself are more of a software business. So talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah. So when we started uh, Parco, uh, we, we shifted a lot. We knew that there was a huge problem to be solved. We just didn't know how, you know. And when we started, there was little comparison on, on companies in, in other parts of the world. Right now, there's a lot, but when we started, there wasn't. So, so we started a lot with uh, hardware solutions. So we we saw that that was not scalable. You know, hardware's fail, uh, and when they fail, you need to have maintenance, you need to have people. Uh, so, so that obviously increased our, our cost by a lot. So we decided that we were going to be a hundred percent a software solution that would work with hardware, and and hardware that sometimes is not our hardware; it's third party hardware. And today we and that was one of the hardest thing in our business. We we took like maybe two years to close on those deals uh, with all of these companies, which are European, Austrian, Chinese, Turkish, etc. That convinced them to integrate with our solution so that we could start transacting on on their on their on their products. So that was another friction that we that we had to do. But that that decision I think was the best decision because that's what really helps us as a company to be really scalable. You know. Because we're a hundred percent software solution that works with with hardware, and talk about what um, the the market looks like outside of Mexico. So, like, what does South America and Central America look like for for this business going forward? Well, actually, it's it's really funny because I would say that maybe in terms of culture in mobility, uh, South America with obviously exceptions, is a little bit more, they have a bigger cultural uh, mobility than Mexico. But obviously in terms of technology, there's there's a little supply still. So so for us, that's a great opportunity right now because it's a blue ocean where we can really take advantage of the time to market that we have. You know, obviously our line of growth was really small in the beginning and right now we're, we're just hitting that scalability. So if we were able to replicate it in 28 cities, for me, really going on to Chile or Colombia or Peru, it's it's one more city, you know? It's, I just have to do an API for the p- processing of cards and I can go anywhere with our same back office here. So so obviously we, we see that there's a great time to market. It's a huge market. So Mexico might be 30% of the market, but the rest is 70% and, and we see uh, that that it's also very concentrated. So it's easy to close big deals that can get you to many cities and and really get a, a huge uh, critic mass. So that's going to be our, our, our next uh, milestone for, for next year, really the regionalization of our solution that obviously has cultural tropicalizations in every place, but it's still uh, as long as we keep on our software um, mindset, we can really replicate our solution in, in the rest of LATAM. And you mentioned at the top of the podcast, you described Parco as the operating system for uh, parking in, in Latin America. And we have a, a strong investment thesis around operating systems for LATAM because we think that basically all these non-digital processes are going to have probably winner take all or winner take most operating systems in, um, in them. So ex- other examples of that are Nuvo Cargo is the operating system to move goods and services from Mexico to U.S. and vice versa. Naver is the operating system for building administration. Um, and we have multiple more like that. Talk a little bit about how you think about being an operating system and why it's an interesting business model for, for LATAM, whether just in your specific case or just more in general. Yeah. So basically, uh, in that term for business, which is parking, obviously, uh, it, it's it, it's just there's a lot of bundle solutions that if you were able to really get them together, you can do a really powerful solution. So for us, it's, we don't define ourselves actually when we sell as a parking app. You know, we actually define ourselves like a 300 degree solution for our clients, you know, because we give them obviously pay by phone solutions, but we also give them uh, big data analytics, proximity marketing solutions, a catalog of promotions and discounts so they can really upload that. Uh, and uh, so we're always uploading new solutions for a client. And that also pretty much that what that helps you is to really you have a distribution, which is our client base. And from there, we can add on verticals uh, to that distribution that it can increase our customer lifetime value. So so for us, parking is the distribution. And from there, we're already working on many operating products that, that can bundle together with our operating system and increase the customer lifetime value and increase the, the, the repeatedly, how repeatedly our, our, our customers interact with our solution and obviously increase their loyalty to our solution. So so definitely, I think it's, it's the way to go. 
And there's a lot of verticals that, we, that we're already working, software service solutions, da big data analytics, auto tech solutions, access control solutions. And it's just all part of the same ecosystem. So between the data and the access control, I would think that one of the big selling points for the mall companies and parking operators is, is security. Yeah. Because in certain parts of Latin America, people are worried about security. And so if you have more data about who's coming in, who's leaving, how long they're staying, you can probably start to see, or at least just be a deterrent because they know that the, the system's in place. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, why why that can be important for, for your clients. Yeah. So obviously security is a very important issue for all of our clients, but also the transparency of what is going on. For example, uh, before we, we we work in a pro project, I remember they would tell me, "Hey, there's a million people come to my to my project every month." And and once we started working, we're like, "No, it's not a million people. You know, it's a hundred thousand people that come ten times a month." So more than than security, we gave them data to really understand what was going on in their ecosystem. You know, so I think that's the most valuable solution that we, we really had because we can give them analytics of what is their recurrency rate to these places. Uh, are they women or male? Uh, what is their, the age concentration? We're also working on a graphic of the social concentration based on, on the type of cell phone that you have. So all of these analytics that we give them really empower them to understand who is their customer and what's the best way to, uh, to attract those customers. So after we've been working with our clients, they have dramatically started changing what experiences do they give to what customers based on the insights that we're giving to them. So that, I think that's something really, really valuable right now. Moreover, than, than the brick and mortar world it has to become an omni-channel solution. You know? And it gives them the, the ability to at least try to compete with the Amazons, Walmarts, yeah. Mercado Libres of the world. Definitely. Yeah. Right now, the, 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 the word is experience. So, so if they can enhance their experience of the users in, this, in these places, they're, they're, they're going to have a good way to go. The problem in LATAM or, or the good thing in LATAM is uh, that the convenience centers and the lifestyle centers are where families engage. You know, here in Mexico, we don't have parks. We don't have streets where we can go walk. So really, these are the places where families come together, where friends come together. So as long as we're enhancing with better solutions and better experiences, I think we're, we have a long way to go. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting in Mexico, the malls are called plazas. Yeah. And in both Chile and Colombia, you'll see usually once a year, twice a year, you'll see editorials complaining about people moving the vida de plaza. So like the outdoor yeah. areas where people used to hang out and meet people to moving to the malls. Yeah. And so in Mexico, just the, even the name of it is is yeah. that. So it's that that whole movement has 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 happened. And it is true. You can see you go on a Saturday or a Sunday and there's people eating, they're going to the movies, they're just walking, they're big family groups. Yeah. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. So going back to when you were first starting the business as this law assistant uh, parking illegally in the center, <laughs> Knowing everything you know today, what, what advice would you give yourself? So, yeah, I mean, the first thing that I would have done maybe uh, was I would have told him that chill out, you know, maybe because I just wanted to, to, to eat everything and do everything at the same time. Probably the best thing that I could have done is maybe go work at a, a startup, uh, maybe three, four years to gain more experience. If I would have done that, I maybe would have avoided a lot of trippings that I did in, in the past because I would have understood a lot of things that, that now I understand. So maybe I would have told him that before uh, doing a business, I would have worked maybe three, four years at another company. That that would think, I think that would have been the best of my advice for myself. And obviously, in consequence, there's a lot of things that we failed in in terms of how to structure the cap table, how to raise capital, because there before there was not the, the capital that we have on the last 12 months, you know, um, how to hire, how to scale teams. So many things that I know right now that if I would have known Five years ago, maybe I would have been here in one year instead of uh, four years that, that that we've been building this solution. You know, do you have any books, blogs, podcasts, or documentaries you like, uh, whether about life or just startups? Yeah, so I normally read more about uh, philosophy and social science. I'm a big fan of that. Right now, I just finished a book called The Almanac by Naval. I forgot the second name. Naval Ravikant. Yeah, yeah. Ravikant. Mm -hmm. I loved it because I think. That's that's my philosophy, you know. Uh, so basically, the book is about how to generate wealth, not money, if not wealth, which is, I think, very different. 
and how that is directly related to your happiness. So, so it's a really short book with really short thoughts, but very profound that, that really got a, a huge impact of how I, I saw the, uh, the, the purpose of why I was building what I was building and what is what I really want to get out of this. So that's a book that I definitely recommend. A practical book, and maybe it's a cliche, but uh, how to make friends and influence people. I mean, it's incredible how those things, if you really apply them, they they just work so well. So definitely that's that's something great. And in terms of podcast, and well, I, I always try to just hear about different things. You know, I don't have like a specific one that I follow. Like I, I hear a lot of cracks because they talk about like very different people. And I think that's what really enhances, you know, like maybe listening to a scientist talking about something, you can relate it. So so I try not to be just like business podcast. I try to just hear about everything and that's where I get the most inspired. So so yeah, that, those would be the best advices. And what does Parco look look like, say, two years from now? So Parco, we're, we're really going to migrate a lot in terms of what is our, our, our what. So right now we're working a lot into auto tech solutions which is something that, that we're going to be working on a lot. And we're also going to be working a lot with software as a service solutions. So those two things are, are going to be our, our two main pillars for, for the next 12 months. And obviously a, a great challenge of regionalization, you know, how, how do we expand that something new, obviously. So that's going to be a great challenge that we're really excited about. So, but we know that, that we have a great product that gives us a uh, really loyal users. So that distribution is really powerful. So, so, we see a very bright future for us. <laughs> we do too. And that's why uh, we've decided to come in and awesome. be partners in the business. And it's it's going to be great to work alongside you to continue to grow all across LATAM and awesome. hopefully turn into the, the default parking app for all Perfect. of the region. Thank you. Thank you. And we're really honored to, to partner with Mark and really excited to, to get on hands on and start working together for next year. It's going to be fun to, to go on that journey together. Yeah. Thanks awesome. for taking the time to do the podcast. Thank you very much, Nate.